Oh, all right. Uh, we are live again. It is Welcome, being uh, recorded. All right. Welcome mm -hmm. to another uh, class with uh, Dr. Craig Wright, and uh, we're going to probably continue what we left last time last week. Is that so? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah, so we're also going to continue into the other aspects of all of this. Now, um, I started talking about the uh, maturity time and, and how that sort mm -hmm. of matters. It seems to be an area that um, people ignore. I mean, all of the mythology around Bit Bitcoin means that people have started ignoring some of these key aspects and say they don't matter. But the reality is that it does. Now, you can't sit there going, oh, well, uh, we can do attack X um, and get away with it when, well, there are already and at the time of launch, there was already a control against it. So mm -hmm. um, now what I want to extend next into is something else uh, I've been trying to explain to people for quite some time, which is uh, Bitcoin's a commodity. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't just mean it's like gold. So can you tell me what you think a commodity is? Uh, at least something that says like uh, I wouldn't say utility. You can use it for something. I don't know rice or uh, um, uh, oil, and it's uh, yeah. it's kind of like a standardized standardized. So you can you can trade it. Mm -hmm. You can yes, and that is the key word. It's standardized. So when you're talking about standardized products, um, there's a big distinction between just something on the market or something that needs to be assayed or anything else. So when we're, when we're discussing um, like wheat, if we want to discuss wheat, then it will be wheat at a particular grade to be delivered at a certain time. Um, if we're doing oil, for instance, there could be standard crude. Uh, there could be uh, Texas sweet. These are all different commodities, even though they're all oil, um, they're, they're actually sold differently. So uh, there are different grades of, of beef and pork beef, belly yes. and frozen orange juice. Mm. Now, all of these are commodities. And so is gold, for instance. Gold is a commodity uh, when it is delivered, for instance, in 99.999995 um, mm. purity in certain, like uh, one ounce, um, uh, one pound, one kilo, etc. cetera, uh, weight determinations. Okay. Now, why do you think this might be the case? Uh, if it's everything is standardized. Now, it allows us to have a contracted, yeah, it's a, a standardized delivery, standardized contract. Um, it just simplifies everything. So when we create a commodity, or when something goes on the um, Chicago Board of Exchange, CME, mm -hmm. et cetera, um, although the Chicago guys are all really merged in as one now, I keep mm -hmm. thinking of them as separate, but I'm old. Um, the, um, the way that this works is um, then there becomes a standard offering. So mm -hmm. um, how do you think something would be if I set up a two-year contract and um, uh, for instance, I'm going to, because I uh, have, have a large milling and um, flour making um, operation, I want to have um, grade zero flour because I sell it to uh, make pasta. Um, that means it's no good giving me different quantities or qualities or uh, sort of mixes of grain at different times, is it now? Other than ones I want or need. If I need yes. something like Durham pasta from Durham wheat, then it's no good giving me um, sort of uh, light flour. No. <clears throat> uh, light, light grain. So the same is in Bitcoin. One of the aspects of all of this that everyone talks about smart contracting. They talk mm -hmm. about the ability to do trade and exchange. Before you can do any of that, you need everything set. Because 
if you're going to be doing um, international contracts, long-term contracts, exchanges of value, then it's not just what it sells on market for, but you need something that can be legally determined to be the product that you purchased. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, yeah, that's of course, everything has to be enough. agreed on. In the yeah, case of... In advance, like any other... <laughs> Like, yeah, like any other like, uh, contract. Yeah. Hmm. So the irony of many of the things where people think you can change Bitcoin is that makes contracting really difficult. Of course, many people in the cryptocurrency, Bitcoin's mm -hmm. not one, uh, community seem to think that law doesn't matter, courts don't matter, people are just going to go and start applying um, transactions without any redress. The reality here is very different. If you're a large investor and um, you're buying something that doesn't form standards, then you could be breaching your fiduciary duties. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to tell people what you're investing in. This is part of the whole um, like the difference between IPOs and um, things like Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, when it's stable, forms a commodity offering. There's no more, there's no extra offers, it's all issued. Now that simplifies a lot of, a lot of different areas. Now, uh, remember, before I did Bitcoin, I did my postgraduate law and then I did my uh, master's in law. Um, and um, uh, I, I specialized in international commercial law and international financial law. And if you want to be able to offer something, then um, there are different ways of doing it. Number one is you can do a securities offering. Okay. In a securities offering, if you're doing a small raise and selling a small amount or doing a small offer, then you don't need to worry too much. You can do um, like web or cloud-based uh, raising. And uh, I believe the limits in America for uh, total exemptions are about 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. Under like, 1.5 uh, million, uh, easy. Okay, like a crowdfunding? That, yes. Mm -hmm. After the, the levels of crowdfunding though, um, then you have to start putting out extra um, sort of explanatory materials. The reason for this is not to make your life harder, but it is protecting the investor. Now, if you think about it for a moment, um, you're trying to raise multiple millions of dollars, potentially. Mm -hmm. So say you're raising um, $100 million, then it starts to become significant. If you're, yes. I mean, people go, a oh, million dollars is a lot of money, but um, uh, you're now running a business. Mm -hmm. Do you think a million dollars is a lot of money anymore? Uh, not compared to like an average Joe on the street, especially now everything is inflated. Exactly. Uh, yeah. you, you have a different perspective when you have to start paying salaries. Mm -hmm. In Enchain, we have... I'm not actually quite sure, but hundreds of staff now mm -hmm. in okay. multiple locations and countries. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them are highly paid and uh, mm -hmm. because they're researchers, uh, sometimes postdoctoral. And um, that requires that you, people aren't happy if you don't pay them on time. Yeah, you know. of course. I mean, like. <laughs> so, so the amount of money um, from a startup to a later stage business is very different. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference here is if you have a, you know, a standard product and that is already out there and standardized, then you don't need to reissue anything. So as an example, uh, you guys are raising more money. Mm -hmm you have to go back and give extra information. 
And that's yes, with course. qualified investors. You're not yeah. going out to um, the public at present. No. Um, so, I mean, I've done this before a few times. In, in Australia, the company that I had was a public company, uh, which was uh, part of the headache behind everything, because once you have a public company, uh, the government sits on your ass every day. And mm -hmm. um, if you are, uh, if you don't do your punctuation correctly, they find, if they don't like you, then they find a reason to cause you difficulties. Um, I recommend if you don't ever need to have a public company, don't do one until you. Okay. Do. Okay. That's uh, some uh, very sound uh, advice. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, people have been arguing that things like Ethereum are like Bitcoin, but that's false. Um, even BTC and the changes, that's false. So if you think about it, people have invested in BTC, in Bitcoin, in um, Ethereum, and all these other assets. If you are changing the way that something works, what happens if someone's invested already? Say I've gone in there and I've purchased a hundred million dollars because of my pension fund. Um, and I've gone out there and bought 50 million Ethereum and 50 million BTC. And I've bought it based on the information on the websites and the white papers, etc. Mm -hmm. And then people change it. What do you think that means? Uh, are they breaching the contract? Well, yes, it's even more than that. It can be misrepresentation. So okay. um, now the arguments that people don't understand, I've been through, I mean, the first time I went through an IPO type process as a backdoor was um, like ancient history. I was 29. So um, okay. you probably uh, weren't even born yet. Um, <laughs> I mean, you already got an IPO yeah. company, so. And if you were, you were yeah. running around in nappies. <laughs> okay. Mm. 90s. Um, but, um, but the process involves telling your investors everything. Mm -hmm. Now, how many people use Ethereum? Use, if you mean like... Um... Uh, probably zero, <laughs> but how many own it? <laughs> oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I mean, I mean. It's probably uh, one person a day uses it, but um, how many people own it? I think it's, uh, my guess is uh, in the millions, at least the so-called investors, whoever has uh, bought the coin. Mm -hmm. um, probably not as many as people think. There's probably a few large investors. Mm -hmm. But those individuals who have invested, well, they now have... Uh, they're owed a fiduciary duty. Mm -hmm. If there are no changes, no raises, no anything else, what duty do you think do you think is owed? Oh, just uh, <clears throat> the original uh, number of coins they bought. Um, it's a promise of what you initially offered. If you haven't changed anything, and uh, that as long as you deliver what you promise, then. Mm -hmm. everything's good. The distinction though is what happens when you change what you're offering? Uh, again, you're kind of like a, to me it's like a bridge in the contract because uh, when I bought the thing is is uh, you are mm -hmm. saying it's uh, Ethereum 1 for mm -hmm. example now you are saying it's, it, you're going to change it to I don't know proof of stake or Ethereum 2. Mm -hmm. That's not what I Mm -hmm. That's what you not what you uh, so, promised when I bought the thing. Hmm. Yeah. So this is part of the reason for doing commodities as well, because it's far simpler. Now, when you start to think about a standardized contract, there's no requirements to update, no requirements to change. The number of Bitcoin were issued in advance. Um, mm -hmm. The distribution policy was done in advance. The value at issue 
um, was in the range of crowdfunding levels. Mm -hmm. um, actually, less because um, okay. even with the, um, the, I mean, my Next. total claims to the government uh, and costs were about one point one million dollars worth of investment. Mm -hmm. um, there's a negative Stupid idiot. should have accepted it. Yeah, you said this about so, uh, your latest article. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the simple answer here is in issuing something like that and not changing it, there's no new white paper, there's no new prospectus, there's no requirements to get buy in from investors. Mm hmm. So, I mean, people haven't realized this because there have been a lot of false um, sort of claims and information out there. But if you take Ethereum, for instance, um, they say how they're decentralized. How many nodes do you know review the code created by the Ethereum group? You mean how many uh, coders? Any? Um... No, no. How many uh, the people the running nodes. miners uh, oh, nodes? Okay. How 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 many how many of them independently get a full static review and analysis of every code change made on Ethereum? Uh, I don't know exact number, but my guess is uh, virtually none of them. It's like a BTC miners. Yep. I think it just um, all push the code. I don't think uh, many miners hmm. review. Hmm. So how many times do you think they? validate um, any updates close to zero protocol changes hmm. so part of the nature of what they call um, a soft fork is an insidiously deceptive move to build in a future change mm -hmm. so what you do is you go well I'm not going to change here but I'm going to build in a change that forces people to accept my later change. Now, the arguments are that everyone buys into this, but um, when was the last time you did a code review um, of any of these products, a full one? Um, I don't know. I don't, I almost never review. Hmm. So, I used to do um, uh, reverse engineering and um, uh, static analysis for part of my living. Um, I'll give you a first question is, how long does it take to write a good, well-documented program on average? I mean, not, no, don't, don't say this is complex. Just on average, how many lines of code do you get a day? Line of code per day. I think usually for, for people like uh, average programmer, like uh, maybe a hundred. If it's a uh, mm -hmm. maybe if it's good enough, yeah, one thousand. Mm -hmm. But usually, yeah, for any like a uh, good project, usually take uh, years. Yeah, usually. Yeah. So here's a, a thing people don't uh, seem to understand. Um, not just an automated BS code reviewer type fluffy stuff that doesn't really tell you any issues. Um, but a proper code review takes at least okay. 10 times the amount of time it takes to write code. Oh, really? It takes more time to review? It takes okay. more time. So if you're given someone else's code and it's not documented, how long does it take you to understand it? I think a lot of time I would rather just uh, prefer <laughs> rewriting if there's no, <laughs> that's uh, always happens to programmers. Yeah. But you don't get to do that, do you? You don't no, get to no, go into their no. GitHub and go, I'm rather. going to rewrite Ethereum because they didn't mm -hmm. document it well and I don't understand what they're doing here. Yeah, so when was the last time long. any um, alternative project let you do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, uh, do you know about the um, compiler bug that was in Linux? Uh, in uh, uh, the linking GCC? bug that was there a few years ago. Yeah, I think I heard a few. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that which one. one you were talking about, CVE or anything? Okay. Yep. GCC is a fairly simple program. 
comparatively. I mean, compilers are not simple, but I mean, compared to something like X window, um, X window is very complex, uh, same as Windows and Microsoft, but X window is a complex program, uh, especially when you have multiple windows now and things like this. Mm -hmm. So um, GCC uh, is comparatively simple. Okay. Yeah, last time I checked, they have a- When do you think that bug was introduced? Uh, maybe many years ago back. It's like the SRO, uh, <laughs> SRO uh, library bug that was been there for like a long, long time, but it uh, turns out nobody's, mm. nobody's uh, checking. So Only one guy's maintained original, half time. Yeah, the original, yeah, the original GCC bug um, predates Linux. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, that's uh, surprising. Uh, because okay. it's taken across from some of the other Berkeley programs. Uh, remember Berkeley and um, mm -hmm. and their their um, BSD sort of uh, little demon um, um, uh, uh, free node of uh, uh, free BSB, yeah, uh, okay. BSD. Remember for, uh, like the uh, Berkeley Linux, uh, sorry Berkeley Unix. It was a proper mm -hmm. Unix. Um, that was there. Mm -hmm. It's still available. I don't know if anyone runs them anymore yeah. because Linux has sucked up the world. But um, uh, when you consider that a bug can be in software, major software used by the majority of corporations around the world, even Microsoft, even IBM, and it's there for 30 years in one of the most critical aspects of code. Do you think that something where a few bodgies running a cryptocurrency project are going to find everything? No, <clears throat> that's a, like an impossible. Yeah, so this is the issue. When you start changing the protocol and changing the code, not only does it affect yourself, but it affects other things. So if you remember, um, um, that silly um, multi-signature uh, wallet um, uh, oh, that okay. Mr. Lop helped found. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that that broke because of BTC at one stage. Mm -hmm. Like a bit code? That, that's a that major about? system. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Is it bit code you're talking about or is it different? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. That silly thing, yep. Mm -hmm. um, so that broke because BTC changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that for a minute. Um, technically, these people who are sitting there going, we're decentralized, mm -hmm. aren't that decentralized. Um, Microsoft have more people pushing code than um, every single cryptocurrency industry times I probably squared to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. um, so we're sitting there going, we're decentralized, but the reality is GitHub, not at all. Um, and all this, we can set up secret squirrel type um, distribution methodologies. Um, and how do you get anyone to trust them? So if you, if you're a miner, do you think you're going to trust a random onion link on Tor? No, no. You invest, um, say, one and a half billion dollars in all your hardware, equipment, sites, facilities. And then what do you do? You go to a random Tor link that someone texted you this morning or sent you on IRC mm -hmm. or Telegram and download that and install it on all your machines. No, but I no mean, one uh, at all no. views anymore. And that just uh, mm. makes sense. So, no. So, are we starting to see what a commodity basis of a system is for now? It has to be like um, predefined and uh, stable. Does have to be? Is that what you're hinting at? Yeah. So, how many times in the last 20 years has um, standard crude changed? 
How many times uh, have they changed the makeup per barrel, the weight, the the mix? I, I don't know the exact number, but probably like a very close to zero, if not zero. Uh, zero, yeah. So okay. I can tell you the exact number, it's zero. Okay. Um, now, the interesting thing people don't realize is there are long-term contracts in commodities. I see. Because if the underlying so there are like organizations change... that buy five or ten years, mm, mm -hmm. you cannot just run. So and if you're say, um, yeah, if you're say Cadbury, um, large chocolate manufacturer, mm. you want to buy a certain standard of cocoa. Okay. You don't want that ever to change. Well, unless you change your own recipe. Um, mm -hmm. But if you know that this is how much you do per year, um, you could actually pre-buy some of the contracts, like say 50% of them for the next 10 years, um, leave some fluctuating in treasury, uh, all sorts of fun, funky things. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is if you uh, buy in advance, sometimes it's cheaper. Now, if you buy in advance and it changes, that sort of screws you around. The same thing happens when you're talking about buying all of these other things like Ethereum, Bitcoin, BTC, no, excuse me, uh, BTC, mm -hmm. etc. If technically the product changes, then you don't have a product anymore. And if technically you have a group who can change it, it's not decentralized at all. Think about that for a minute. I mean, if it's a decentralized commodity, um, once a commodity um, is issued, it's decentralized because anyone can fill it. Mm -hmm. um, after set in stone, there is a commodity issue on oil, standard crude, Texas sweet, etc. The contract states this is what it will be. You can buy 20 years in advance. You can do all sorts of funky things. No one changes it. It's set. Mm -hmm. Now, if you now think about that for a minute and how it applies to other things, um, where can you get your oil? I don't know. Middle East? Uh... Is there any... It's all over the place. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Where can you grow grain? Yes, everywhere. Anywhere. So if you say, I want Durham re uh, wheat for um, um, flour grade zero, then if I meet that standard, that's all that people care about. Mm -hmm. Can you see now that that's decentralized? Yeah, because you're I don't care where the wheat yeah. comes from. Yeah. Where Ethiopia. Comes from. Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Germany, England, America. It's Why would I care anymore? Because mm -hmm. it's a commodity. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of standardization and commoditization. Mm -hmm. That's how economically we make a decentralized product. We don't have it as a political thing where people sit there and vote on it and change things. Now, if a year from now, I've made my 20 year contract to buy uh, grade zero wheat. And a year from now, a group decides we're going to change the offer of the standard. Not good. What do you think happens? Um, I think the contract is, uh, will be uh, effective because if I'm, uh, let's say I'm uh, using, I don't know, one, let's say $1 to buy one pound of, uh, let's say grade zero flour, and now you are giving me the same mm. name, but <laughs> you're like a very low quality flour. That, that's not what uh, I signed up for. Well, it could be high quality, but a different grade. For instance, if you try to use a fine grade flour, like uh, light flour, uh, making pasta, like um, like the sort of flour that you'll use in 
in making your souffle. Uh, mm -hmm. If you had a uh, egg uh, and flour type uh, cake, or a, uh, imagine uh, sp uh, the sort of flour that you have for sp uh, sponge cakes. Mm -hmm. That's not going to work if you're making oh, okay. pasta. Pasta is a heavy flour. Mm. Um, so you, you want something heavy, sticky, etc. You don't want the same consistency uh, in your lasagna as your sponge mm. cake. No, okay. I mean, different things, different uses. So if you have them substituted, then now you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. So are you going to accept delivery of the wrong thing because someone changed the nature of the product? No, if I buy like purchase some order, it has to be whatever, whatever I, <clears throat> mm -hmm. when I bought it, it has to come in the form mm. as specified. Mm. Yeah. So um, if I buy something that has a certain grade, such as BTC, and then you change the nature of BTC so that it is less friendly to law enforcement, then that has impacts. If you have Ethereum and it is issued as a proof of work system, but you now change it to proof of stake and the control of the system is now changed from a decentralized platform to, well, uh, the Ethereum group owns majority of stakeable Ethereum, which means it's now completely controlled by a small group, including Vitalik. Mm -hmm. um, then that's a change. Okay, just a uh, play devil's advocate here, just uh, because of Bitcoin and Ethereum to me, it seems uh, different. When, when Bitcoin is launched, it, it's uh, specifically said it's set in stone, right? But Ethereum, I think the there's no such thing that they unless when, it's BTC, launch, BTC, yeah, uh, BTC, yeah. The Ethereum in theory they can just yeah, tinker I mean, with it. They, they can change it, whatever. Of... Yeah. So it's not um, because they, when he launched it but, first, they also say, hmm. you know, it's not. It doesn't have to stay this way. We are just keep tinkering, changing it. I agree, mm -hmm. but then. If you run a company, uh, do you have to change what you originally put out? Can you um, use your original IPO document or your original fundraising document later? If no. you've changed the nature of what you've done, if you've pivoted, if you've altered it? No. It, it, so why do changed. Ethereum get to do that? So this is the issue. Everyone's running around misleading um, in misrepresenting and saying, well, here we are, we're Ethereum, we're decentralized because we've got miners. There's mm -hmm. less than 10 miners that have any say in Ethereum mm -hmm. at all. And there only ever will be. And if they go to proof of stake, there'll be one or two individuals okay. ever so in a staking model you have what is not used from those who are wealthy and have a lot and those that use so you need to take out all the used item the stuff that is deployed that is um, actually utilized now if you have 70% of your network, uh, like your, uh, your Ethereum utilized, that means only 30% can stake. Mm -hmm. That means those with a lot of money that can earn money over time and afford not to, to spend their savings, you know, big incumbent players, banks, they do it. So Vitalik, et cetera, want to be a bank. Mm -hmm. They want to put their money up, hold it, and be a rentier who gain money over time. Now, if you consider, how much do the Ethereum Foundation own of the Ethereum network? Uh, uh, majority, I guess. 
Hmm. So say that they want to, they've got 40% that they can stake of the entire network. 70% mm -hmm. will be used. Okay. So they can make a supply cut by not putting some out. Um, they can do a whole lot of other aspects. And, um, but even if 70% um, of the remainder is all that's used, then, and Ethereum are down to only 40% of the total supply, then they could actually put, say, 30% of the total supply down, mm -hmm. um, whereas the rest of the network will have um, sort of, say, uh, even 50% uh, of the network by 70%, which is 35. Mm -hmm. So immediately, you have one group, Ethereum group, who now have 30% against 35%. And that sounds okay, until you realize that they actually can put 40% in there at any time they want. Mm -hmm. and get 100% control. Remember, 51% is 100% control here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they can say, uh, they can split this into a billion parts and say, we are decentralized. Yeah. one billion different decentralized players. Mm -hmm. Look, a billion pseudonymous addresses. Guess what? They're not. Mm -hmm. So, if you're going to be offering banking and node services, you need to have KYC and AML. Mm -hmm. These guys have been misrepresented, uh, misrepresenting what they're doing, how they're doing it. And basically, uh, they like to accuse me of things because what they are doing is in financial services legislation, fraudulent. To be fraudulent, you cannot, you're not honest. Okay. What is control? Right. Control is the ability to update software. When individuals such as Vitalik come out and say, we're changing the code, it changes. When that foundation makes variants, it changes. Hmm. All this, oh, it can fork. What BS? It is complete and utter control. So, what I'm getting back is the only way you decentralize something rather than having it as a security or pseudo security or illegal security is you make it a commodity. You standardize it because as I said, as soon as you have a standardized product, you no longer care that it's the Chicago board of exchange or um, uh, CME. You no longer care that you got it from a London Commodities Exchange, or the Australian um, uh, sort of uh, securities and um, uh, et cetera exchange, or the New Zealand one, or the Iranian one. You don't care. You don't care about the input because that's what fungibility is. Mm -hmm. It is, I want X number of validated goods. So, in this sense, um, how 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 is a Bitcoin uh, commodity in this sense? Is it because it is a setting stone? That's the only aspect. Or hmm. so, well, that that's one big aspect, but it's known in advance. So when I said there are twenty-one million times one hundred um, uh, million tokens. Uh, each minted in coins, so much per per um, um, average 10 minute block using these procedures with this, then guess what? That's a standardized commodity. When I said these are the code constructs and we don't need to change the protocol to add more, we might need to fix some of the security issues. Mm -hmm. But that's an under delivery and not over promising. Mm -hmm. We might need to um, 
build new systems to be able to scale. But again, the promised system is defined. So you can go out there in a unilateral contract, because that's what it is, and offer everything in advance. So someone who earns something 10 years ago still has validity today. Aren't you that's mean what it's I got... about. If I, for instance, sorry? So when you, when you say earn 10 years ago, like, um, I don't know, uh, Satoshi tokens or what? what, what? I'm just trying to see mm -hmm. what what exactly you mean. Like, a, what what is a commodity? Is a each token or so? Um, the ability to script was the same ten years ago as it is. Okay. Uh, well, now minus a few muck ups mm -hmm. in the middle from people um, mm -hmm. trying to make sure they don't work. The format, the ability to use certain constructs is the same. The number of Bitcoin is the same. The promised delivery is set. So all of those things are predefined. Now, if I could go and change them, if I could go, there's 22 million now, mm -hmm. it's not a commodity anymore because it's outside of the contract. Mm -hmm. If I'm able to make that change, then that's what people, like everyone argues, decentralized. But decentralized is set in stone. It is commodity. It is defined. It is a known item. As soon as someone else comes out there and changes it, it's not. As soon okay. as you say, why don't we make the protocol different? I'm offering something new. As soon as I say, why don't I pump out this system um, with 42 million Bitcoin? It's not the same thing. Why don't I change and add these other protocol constructs? It's no longer the same thing. Why don't I add this um, uh, op crime coin like Roger wanted mm -hmm. uh, and enable uh, Bitcoin to be untraceable? Because it's not the same thing. If you want to create something alternative and compete, that's fine. But that's a different issue, mm -hmm. a different offer. Um, and the difference here as well is when I released Bitcoin, the only Bitcoin I get to maintain outside of the offer are those that I um, go into the contract myself and obtain back or someone else I know does or anyone, etc. It's back in the... Um, the way that it's done. Sorry, it'll just be a sec. Let's cancel that. Okay. Um, now, what this means is um, it's all defined without the need for continuing offers. Mm. There's no, I kept this number. So the argument is Craig has 21 million Bitcoin at the launch, which I did. But those 21 million were all defined, issued, and then put into a contractual basis to be distributed. Mm -hmm. Not like Ethereum, where some are kept. Pre yeah. Not where BTC, where uh, there's a reissue and change in taxable value. Mm -hmm. See the so distinction just... here? Yeah, just want to put a more concrete example. It's like uh, now I have some, um, I don't know, standard oil going out. Then I define some, um, mm. let's say it was a, a barrel of oil. Mm -hmm. And then maybe mm. one year later, Rockefeller just uh, went there. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, now I changed the size of the barrel. Is it uh, a valid mm -hmm. analogy there? Then it's not uh, what you sign for and uh, which makes it not a commodity anymore. If they can, you can just randomly change the size. It's a different commodity, yeah. Different commodity. It is now a new commodity. So here's something else people don't think about. If you do that, that has tax implications. If you have commodity A, and even if Rockefeller's got a new, better version of oil mm -hmm. that isn't sold under the same 
agreement, but he reissues it. He says, we're now in barrels that are in kilograms instead of pounds for the same rate because everything's so much cheaper. And he sells that. You go, well, that's great. I'm going to migrate my contracts to this new one. You might want to. Guess mm -hmm. what, though? There's a tax implication. Even you just only change the units without changing anything essential? No, you can't. You actually now have a new tax obligation. You actually have a tax event at that point. So when there is a change in the standard, tax law goes back hundreds of years on this topic. The new product, if you move to it, is a tax event. Hmm. Trust me, I've been through court okay. on this sort of topic many times. Hmm. And I'm the one sitting here who won. Okay, yeah, I mean, you <laughs> it defeats the tax office, so <laughs> that's... Uh... Uh, well, that's because I wasn't actually doing anything that, uh, like, hmm. that, that was actually wrong. Um, hmm. you know, I was just doing something new, which makes people upset as well. But um, so the distinction here is if I have product A and I stay with product A, then there's no tax event. Mm -hmm. But if I have product A and I move to product B, at the time I move, it's a tax event. And product B isn't defined because a bunch of bucket shop exchanges say that BTC is Bitcoin. Is it the same? Is the protocol the same? Has the, mm -hmm. uh, the have you added something like SegWit? Have you added something like Taproot? Are they backward compatible on the other protocol? Okay. These are all issues that will start coming out in the next few years that people will find out will cause them problems. So imagine now that you've had uh, BTC, or you've had you had Bitcoin since. Um, you bought it for a dollar ten um, in like 2012 at one of those points, and you bought ten thousand dollars worth. So you've got uh, maybe nine thousand um, unsplit Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Guess what your tax event is on? Um, BTC is is changed, so there's a tax event. But uh, versus yes. original. So you've got this no. airdrop of something new. So this is, is exactly analogous to company shares, etc. Um, in the issue of shares, when there's a demerger, which is where companies split into different entities, then um, the original thing and the new thing are two different entities. It doesn't matter what you consider about. Um, a ticker symbol, etc. It, it matters about mm -hmm. different corporate um, mm -hmm. issues. So if you have version one and version two, then version two has changed. It has added new features. It's got bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. Even if they're better, which BTC is not, mm -hmm. then that is a tax event. So interestingly enough, if you um, had Unit one or A, and it, it stays at a dollar. Um, you bought it at a dollar ten, and unit B had gone up to fifty dollars. What you now have is a ten cent um, offset against a fifty dollar gain, and you pay that fifty dollars immediately. So um, the argument, of course, is running around going, oh, all these other things are a fork because they want to misrepresent what's out there. The reality is, the test is, what is most the same? Mm -hmm. What is changed? And if you can sit there and compare these things and go, this is different to that, then the one that's changed, the one with SegWit, the one with 
uh, moving from proof of work to proof of stake. That's the one that's distinct. Okay. That's the so, varied version. Any other like uh, big implications uh, of whether being a commodity or not, uh, besides this uh, tax event? I guess the public tax event is the one that like, might. Well, um, so if you raise money and you misrepresent what you're doing to the shareholders, mm -hmm. what happens? My God, I'm uh, committing fraud. Well, um, okay. we can also sue you for misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, you can start to understand why the core devs are all running around going, we're not responsible. It's not our fault. We're not fiduciaries. Mm -hmm. Because they understand that they are responsible. They make the change. Computers don't make the change. People okay. do. Mm -hmm. I've got, mm -hmm. I mean, all this BS about, oh, it's decentralized. No, it's not. There is no decentralized committee. Even if you had a voting system, guess what you now have? Yeah, people you have a corporation. Have okay. Yeah, you have a corporation. And all of those individuals will have to put in KYC and be known. Because otherwise, how do you know it's not one person? and voting a hundred times. You don't know. There's no such thing as an anonymous share um, sort of vote here. So. Yeah, I think this is now, what people need to start looking at. Is this a commodity design even at the beginning of the Bitcoin or is it some, something that's Correct. a... Uh, okay. Where people talk about decentralized, what they need to realize is the way that I was able to decentralize Bitcoin is I told people, you don't fork my project. I have reasons not to fork it, technical ones, but also set in stone. I was very clear with everyone about that. You don't change my damn protocol. Okay. I should have actually hammered it home a lot more, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm doing it now. So this is the whole purpose and reason. All of the lies out there about Bitcoin's a decentralized coders law system. No, it's not. When in 2003, Timothy Wu um, wrote an, a series of papers and basically tore a new asshole against um, Lawrence Lessig's complete twaddle that he called coders law. Um, and I say tear the new asshole and that's being nice to him. Because okay. the complete utter dribble that Lawrence Lessig's put out there um, that a lot of people in Silicon Valley still spout now was crud. Machines don't think. There's no AI that is a GII. There are narrow AI and they take human input and make human decisions. The example that people use about um, um, like the music learning system, I forget the guy's name, um, that made a whole lot of um, uh, pieces of uh, musical score that were adequate. None of them were particularly good, but adequate um, from a machine involved human choice. He would sit there and listen to it and go, yes, no. Mm -hmm. And the machine would then learn from that and go more like he says yes, more likely he said no, and he would keep doing it and keep doing it. It's humans making choice. Mm -hmm. When Amazon Turk hires people to sit there going, cat, okay. cat, dog. cat, dog, humans. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as unsupervised learning, mm -hmm. apart from humans and animals and plants and mm -hmm. even plants bloody learn. That's the irony here. We even have plants learning better than any computer that we've got. Okay. So for, yeah. for Bitcoin to be a commodity, is, anyway, it, is, is this uh, mostly for, for legal reason? Or there's also it technical? needs to be stable. It's, um, I mean, the thing to think about is contracts are legal in that they're um, sort of a private law offering. But they also have other implications because government has to stick their finger in everything. But the reality here is, even if you didn't have government, a contract 
is a binding thing in any system that survives, any system that works. The whole mm -hmm. concept of a smart contract, is it is a contract. Mm -hmm. And that means you have made a promise and set a standard. And then you shit, the, shit all over your customers and go, I'm going to change it now. You don't really have a contract or you have breached it. So commodities don't change. And the only way, and I'm going to emphasize the only way that any blockchain system will ever be remotely decentralized is when someone says, the protocol set in stone, we don't change it. Not nodes, not any of this other co complete BS. Someone issues it, some dictatory type person like me says, this is what the hell I'm doing don't like it too bad and drops it. That's it. Full stop. Yeah. Yeah. So, that seems uh, um, not uh, too hard to understand, but uh, somehow people keep uh, listening for some reason. I don't know. We're getting little understand. bit by little bit. We're getting it all through, but here's, here's the key. If I say you can't change the protocol, I can't change the protocol. Mm -hmm. That's decentralized. Nobody can change the protocol. The whole point is decentralized because nobody changes. Internet protocol, IP, TCP, UDP, etc. All work because nobody changes the base protocol. You can propose a new version like IPv6, but it's not IP. It is not IPv4. It is a alternative system. And even then, TCP is the same. So, anyway, uh, until next week, I guess. Okay, yeah, that's probably good enough for people to digest in one week. So, commodity, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Yep. Okay, enjoy the rest of okay. the day and uh, see you next time. Then. All right. Okay, bye-bye. All right, and I'll talk okay. to you soon. Okay. Soon. Okay.